Hello, uh, bonjour, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the Human Rights Research and Education Center. My name is John Packer, uh, and I'm the director of the center and a professor of law in the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa. Uh, bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue à notre centre uh, d'enseignement de recherche uh, sur le droit de la personne ici à l'Université d'Ottawa. Uh, je m'appelle John Packer, je suis le directeur du centre et aussi and Professor de Dois at the University of Ottawa. Uh, today we have a, a great uh, event, timely, and uh, with a really stellar lineup. Uh, grateful to the speakers. Uh, let me just uh, say a few uh, brief remarks uh, of uh, partly housekeeping and uh, and a couple of other points. Uh, first of all, this is a recorded session, and it will be available uh, uh, posted online uh, after the session. Uh, the session is conducted in the English language. Uh, mais pour uh, no, no, uh, nos amis francophones, vous êtes bienvenus de poser vos questions également en français ou anglais. Uh, you can do so through the Q&A or through the chat function. Donc, il y a les fonctions uh, disponibles. Uh, the topic of our discussion is uh, climate change and environmental human rights on the Tibetan plateau. Uh, before going forward, allow me to acknowledge the land from which I am addressing you uh, here at the University of Ottawa. Uh, we pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. And we pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. Uh, it is also, uh, as you can see from the uh, uh, screen behind me, the 40th anniversary of the Human Rights Research and Education Center. It was created in 1981-82, was our first year, and that linked with uh, another 40th anniversary now commencing, which is of our charter of rights and freedoms for which our university and our center played an intimate role. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, uh, hand over to uh, our longtime friend and associate at the center, Alex Neve. Uh, Alex is a senior fellow at the uh, uh, Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa and also an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Law. Alex, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, John, and, and hello, everyone. And, and I, too, am joining from unceded uh, Algonquin territory. So we are weaving together three very important topics today, each of which could be, and in fact, regularly is the theme of entire conferences on their own. Human rights, the environment and the climate crisis, the situation in Tibet. But it's the critical point of intersection amongst those three pressing issues that is our focus today, climate change and environmental human rights on the Tibetan plateau. And as you're going to hear, and I'm sure many of you already know, this is urgent. Uh, it is a grave concern in its own right. Uh, and it is also illustrative of and emblematic of global realities and challenges when we, that we face when it comes to the climate crisis and human rights. Certainly is timely. Um, and uh, I do have to tell you, we actually didn't set out deliberately to schedule today's panel discussion to coincide with the Beijing Winter Olympics, uh, but here we are. Um, you know, and, and I think we'll all be aware of that, that our conversation is proceeding against that backdrop, which has certainly put China's human rights record, including with respect to Tibet, uh, into the spotlight, or at least into some spotlights. And we could not be more fortunate uh, to have three knowledgeable and passionate experts and advocates with respect to all three uh, of the themes that intersect, the environment, human rights, Tibet. And, uh, and their conversation about this crucial topic will no doubt be informative, challenging, troubling, uh, and we hope inspire action. Their impressive experience is more fully summarized in their bios, which were included uh, on the online registration page for today's event, so I won't repeat all of that. But just to remind you very briefly, 
We have David Boyd, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, an environmental lawyer, and an associate professor in the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia. We have Pema Doma, uh, who is the campaigns director with Students for a Free Tibet and has been actively engaged uh, in that organization's Tibet climate crisis campaign. She has extensive experience in racial, economic and environmental justice campaigns and has in interned in both the US Congress and Senate. And we have Elizabeth May, uh, who is parliamentary leader of the Green Party of Canada, uh, the former leader of the party and the member of parliament for the riding of Saanich Gulf Islands. And Elizabeth was also previously the executive director of the Sierra Club of Canada. So lots of experience, knowledge, expertise to draw upon. And here's how we're going to roll uh, with the conversation. I'm going to have the great good fortune of steering a discussion among our three panelists. Uh, I'll be posing some questions to all three of them. Uh, other questions will be directed to them individually. Each question, I have to admit, could be the topic of a full-blown speech on its own. Uh, so they're only going to be sharing some high level thoughts and reflections. And in total, that should keep us going for about 45 to 50 minutes. Uh, and then we will have some time for questions from you. And at that point, I will ask you to share questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, keep them as short and focused as possible, and I will endeavor to get to as many of them as possible. So uh, with the ground set, let's get underway. And the first question is one that I am going to pose to all three of our panelists uh, and give them each about three minutes to answer. Uh, and, it's, and it sort of sets the ground, I guess, for our conversation in many ways. You each come from a different perspective, UN human rights expert on the environment, uh, decades of environmental activism outside and inside the Canadian parliament, and a frontline campaigning and advocacy focus on the situation in Tibet. Uh, but you're all here today because I'm assuming uh, that you agree this is an important conversation to be having. So from those different perspectives, why is today's topic an important and timely one to be discussing? And uh, Pema, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Alex. Um, my name is Pema. I use Shira pronouns, and I'm also speaking from uh, so-called Massachusetts um, on Turtle Island as well. And I think, Alex, uh, you had said about five minutes instead of three, so I'm going to take you up on well, Five that. minutes is your next question. Oh, okay, three, great. So um, I think, so I wanna just begin by saying that the situation inside Tibet is, uh, it's, Tibet is not only on the front lines of climate change, um, but there are also several other reasons that make it such a critical discussion that we need to be having, um, you know, yesterday, but if not now, uh, and th those are kind of the intersection of how colonization and human rights abuses, um, you know, intersect with uh, an area, a region of the world in Tibet that is so critical for not only the environment in Tibet, but for all you know, those living in Asia and also beyond Asia. Uh, so firstly, I just wanted to share a little bit about what makes Tibet so critical in terms of an environmental standpoint. Um, so Tibet's um, mountains and glaciers and its you know, climate and ecosystem have really established um, it's like centerpiece in the region and Tibet's waters and fresh waters through its rivers actually provide, um, you know, sustenance to one in five people in the entire world. It also provides food security to actually over half of the world's entire population. Uh, and then another, you know, really critical aspect of what Tibet's environment does for others and for the world is stabilizing and establishing monsoon seasons, both north of Tibet and south of Tibet. And so what these kind of all start to mean is that it, it puts together a puzzle where it says, if there is, you know, there will be climate change in Tibet just as everywhere else in the world. Um, but that climate change in Tibet will actually impact um, virtually every single person living on this earth in catastrophic ways. 
Um, in addition to that, also um, Tibet also through the grasslands and through you know permafrost has really kept a lot of carbon you know captured in a certain area. Uh, and as climate change escalates, um, what we can start to see is that Tibet warming at a rate of th an average of three times faster than the rest of the world will actually start to escalate climate change um, you know, all around the world um, at a greater speed as well. And so now when it comes to the Tibetan people and why this issue starts to intersect with colonization and human rights abuses, uh, I think the most important thing that comes to my mind is the people of Tibet. Uh, in particular, the nomads who are the indigenous people of Tibet that have been, um, in, like you know, practicing pastoralism for over ten thousand years, and their way of life has really—they're not climate activists. Climate activism is them. Like everything from when they wake up to the morning, the way that they live their lives, the way that they raise their children, and the way that they sustain their livelihoods—it's all embedded in the very principles of you know sustainable environment. Uh, and so when you think about those are the people that have done this for 10,000 years. And this is a critical aspect of the environment. Uh, and now just their way of life is being criminalized by the Chinese government. Um, so for now, I'll just stop by adding that the Chinese government since the 1980s has uh, resettled forcibly and coercively resettled over 2 million Tibetan nomads uh, from the grasslands of Tibet. And so I'm sure we'll get in a lot more into the discussion. That's great. Thanks, uh, Pema. I think that gives us a really good beginning. Um, David, uh, how about over to you in a sense of why it's important to be having today's conversation? Well, I think this is a critically important conversation because as everybody knows, we are in, in, embroiled in the midst of this multiple interlocking environmental crisis around the world, which is not only the climate crisis, but also the collapse of biological diversity, the pervasive pollution of the planet, the surge in emerging infectious diseases, shortages of water and, and so, so on and so forth. It's a, it's a horrifying catalog of environmental crises. And these crises we have attempted to fight, and I, it pains me to say this, but we've attempted to deal with these environmental crises as environmental problems through environmental law for over 50 years now. And I think we can look back with a sense of uh, disappointment at the way that environmental law has failed to really stem these environmental challenges. And I think that that, ties into what Pema was saying, we need to go deeper. And so that's why people are beginning to look at this through a human rights lens. And if we think about the, the course of human history, you know, we have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change saying that we need systemic and transformative changes. Environmental law has never delivered systemic and transformative changes, but human rights law has. If we look at the abolition of slavery, the emancipation of women, the end of apartheid, these were struggles where human rights played a critical role in bringing about societal transformations. And it's never easy, it's never quick. And this climate struggle, this struggle for climate justice will take, I'm afraid to say it, but it will take decades to turn this global economy around, but we have to do it. And so I think it's actually critical that we talk about a human rights-based approach to all aspects of the climate crisis, whether we're talking about mitigation, adaptation, or loss and damages. And you know, I know that time is limited in this kind of opening round, but I'd like to talk about some of the challenges that we face and also some of the opportunities that we face. I mean, if we look at, it's been 30 years now since nations of the world agreed in 1992 on the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, agreed to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the Earth's climate system. Well, clearly we have not fulfilled that commitment. Uh, in fact, greenhouse gas emissions have risen over 70% since the, that framework convention was negotiated 30 years ago. So we, ha we have to do something differently. Uh, it's clear that past approaches aren't working. And I, as I said, I believe that human rights-based approach has the potential for achieving those kinds of systemic and transformations that are so urgently needed. Great, thanks, David. And, and absolutely, there will be more questions that delve into both the opportunities and the challenges, as you've noted. Um, uh, Elizabeth, uh, obviously, your voice has been telling us all for just a few years, yes, that this is a very important conversation. Uh, so, um, so how do you frame that today? Why, uh, and, and you know, I guess the particular conversation we're having today, uh, why is it so vital? It's hard to, to, to approach this. Let me just say, I'm, I acknowledge the territory where I am today. I, I'm actually 
David Boyd's member of parliament. He also lives in Saanich Gulf <laughs> Islands. I happen to be in Vancouver preparatory to heading to Ottawa. So I'm on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil people. And I raise my hands to them. And I raise my hands to all of you as a tradition in this territory of Coast Salish people. And the language of the territory where I live is Zenchothan. So it's a heishka, heishka siam. It is good to see you all. And thank you for this. But I don't, I'd like to frame this about why it matters so much that we keep the planet cold enough that we protect the Tibetan plateau. We can, we can express it in many different ways. The peoples of the region, if you count what is basically described now around the world as the third pole, we have the North Pole, the South Pole, we have that is more than the Tibetan plateau. It's also the Himalayas, Hindu Kush, a region of mountains and ice which are referred to as the third pole and for good reason. They contain an enormous amount of ice and the recharging up from the glaciers feeds the major rivers of Asia, the Indus, um, the Ganges, the Yellow, the Yangtze, you know, uh, the Bra, Mampatu. These are all key for the watersheds. The watersheds of these regions have half the world's population living there. So it's not just an environmental issue, and it is a human rights issue. It's also a geopolitical security issue. You start losing the, the major rivers of Asia, watersheds where half the world's population lives. It's desperately dangerous. Now, we are now at 1.1 degrees Celsius global average temperature increase above what we were before the Industrial Revolution. These concepts are very messy and this is exactly how it's always phrased, where we are relative to before the Industrial Revolution in terms of global average temperature. The Paris Agreement commits us to hold to 1.5 degrees global average temperature increase and, and to stay as far below two as possible. I have to say that people working on this and I've been working on climate negotiations since the late 80s, it's, it's an appalling record of, of failure. It, I, I could go back and it, talk about the Montreal Protocol that worked to save the ozone layer. We have not used tools that work climate negotiators were not allowed the tools that work. And that's a longer conversation. So at 1.1 degrees Celsius global average temperature increase, the world is experiencing massive and dangerous extreme weather events. And of course, there's been a significant impact of warming on the Tibetan plateau. So what I'd say is that the, the geopolitical issue here is can we align the, the rights of the people of Tibet can we, and it's certainly the case that the People's Republic of China and its government is an essential part of a solution to the climate crisis. And what I believe motivates a lot of the people who are, are in the leadership of the People's Republic of China is they do not deny climate change. They are not Trump-like. They are looking at a significant security threat and they engage in meaningful ways in global climate negotiations, but there's always this huge, I mean, it's, it's not just an elephant in the room, it's an elephant bigger than the room, is the human rights abuses and the oppression uh, and, and uh, <sighs> occupation of Tibet, the, the suppression of human rights. They all align around a solution, which is how do we engage the government, People's Republic of China, and recognizing that just as in the Arctic, Anybody who's working in the circumpolar north and permafrost issues knows that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. The global repercussions are huge. Same thing with the third pole or sometimes called the Asian water towers. We have a global responsibility to make sure they don't thaw. How do we do that? We have to line up with human rights concerns, geopolitical concerns, and also just explaining to people that at 1.1 degrees Celsius, this is already dangerous. We're hoping to hold to 1.5 degrees Celsius and virtually no one, I'm, I'm struggling to hang on to my belief that it can happen. Almost no one believes we can hold to 1.5 degrees. It can't, I, I agree with David, it may take decades, but the heavy lifting has to be done in the next few years. And Canada is on track to helping the world go to three degrees, just to put it in perspective. So uh, uh, Pam, I think Elizabeth's given a good segue to the next question I wanted to ask you. She's referred to the elephant bigger than the room uh, being that, uh, that reality of, of massive human rights violations playing out in Tibet. 
wondering if you could share with us, give us a bit of an overview, and I know this would take two hours to do it justice, but a bit of an overview, uh, and you've touched on this a little bit in your first uh, remarks, uh, as to what is happening uh, in the Tibetan plateau. Uh, what are the impacts of the climate crisis, I guess, both for the environment and of course, vitally for the people uh, living in that area? Absolutely, thank you, Alex. Um, so to begin, the like in the Tibet, in Tibet, in historical Tibet, on the plateau of Tibet, um, whatever kind of you refer to Tibet as, um, I think there is the elephant bigger than the room that Elizabeth was referring to, which is that China controls virtually every aspect of policy and way of life within that region, and that also includes they, you know, they control access to that region. And this was something that came up a lot um, in Glasgow when we were there for COP. We had an interdisciplinary panel, which was made up of uh, climate and uh, anthropology experts, as well as uh, Tibet climate experts and researchers. And one of the big issues that was coming up again and again was that there just wasn't enough data on that region to have a really accurate sense of what's going on. Uh, and you know, we've seen that play a role in not just climate change or human rights, but also in geopolitical conflicts already in um, you know, situations where lives have literally already been lost because of um, you know, China's control and grasp on vital life-saving information coming from upstream regions, um, Tibet, and, and refusing it to give it to downstream communities in India or in other places. And we've already seen you know, a trickle of lives being lost at this point um, and where you know, by mid-century, of the 21st century, water security is, uh, sorry, water shortages are gonna be largely centered in Asia. Uh, and I think when you go back to the question of why that happens, it's because there isn't access to Tibet for researchers or for scientists. Uh, and similarly, you know, there was even, um, there are even, you know, uh, graphics, which I wish I had one to show you guys, but uh, that show the concentration of uh, research sites where scientists are based and located collecting and gathering data. And there's just certain regions of Tibet, which make up like half of its entire, um, you know, political border that have maybe one or two uh, data collecting sites over hundreds and thousands of square uh, kilometers. And it's just something that doesn't make any sense and would never happen in a non-authoritarian regime. That would just never be the case. And also once these scientists, there are, you know, a few um, sites, just one or two within a majority of um, Western and Southern Tibet, where there is data being collected. But now all this data has to go through the Chinese government and, and it has to be approved before it's shared with the wider community. And these scientists, many of whom we really truly believe are well-meaning people who believe and care about climate change. Uh, and they're just, they, they kind of justify it to themselves. So if I wanna be in this region, I have to be following these protocols. And so that creates a situation where politics is directly interfering with just basic knowledge of climate change. What's happening in that area, which is, as we, you know, have, have laid down, one of the most critical areas. Um, but what we do know for a fact is that not only in Tibet, but everywhere in the world, that indigenous communities and pastoralism are both things that have really increased climate sustainability. You know, indigenous communities make up five percent of the world's population, but they protect over eighty percent of biodiversity in the world. And we know that biodiversity creates resilient communities that are more resilient to climate change. And we know that pastoralism has helped keep grasslands vibrant. Uh, but inside Tibet, now we see both of those things being criminalized. Um, I want to just share the story of Andre, uh, sorry, Andre Seng, uh, Anya Sangda and his brother, Jim Three. Anya and Jim Three were Tibetan nomads who, uh, because as nomads have very, very close connections with um, the environment, with the land, with the species that they coexist with and have symbiotic relationships with, um, they saw the illegal poaching of Tibetan of uh, endangered Tibetan species, and they reported it to the government. And not only that, they took action. They organized their community to start a petition to reduce illegal poaching of endangered species in Tibet. And the repercussion for that was that they were both arrested and detained. And Jim Three actually died in custody. And Anya Sengda was sentenced to six years in prison. He's still in prison right now. And so this is the impact the lived experiences for Tibetans inside Tibet. If the local communities who have shown for 10,000 years that they know what's best for that environment, they've kept it healthy and alive, are being criminalized for caring about endangered species and, and the land, then what kind of message does that send to other Tibetans? 
Uh, and I also want to share the story of Kunchok Jinpa. He was a Tibetan from Tibet who had come to exile, but chose to go back uh, as a way to break that wall of, you know, um, lack of information flow. And one of the things that he shared information with the world um, about was um, the protests and uprisings of Tibetans in the community of Juru against extractive mining projects. So we know that these extractive mining projects are bad for the environment. And Kunchuk Jinpa was one of the brave people who took action to actually share that information outside of the, outside of the, the tight you know, um, information seal of Tibet. And in 2013, Kunchuk Jinpa's last known words to the world were shared, which were, I am now at the bank of a river. There are many people behind me watching me, and I'm sure to be arrested. Even if they arrested me, even if they arrest me, I am not afraid. Even if they kill me, I have no regrets. But from now on, I will not be able to give reports. If there is no word for me, that means I have been arrested. Those were the last known words of Kunjok Jempa before he died in Chinese custody. And so if that's the level of sacrifice that a Tibetan climate uh, researcher or an environmental activist and nomad who's protecting endangered species, that's the level of risk that they're taking while they're also living in the most, one of the most impacted areas of the world by climate change. Um, that shows us that actually we're looking at a very bleak future for the movement for climate change and that the international community actually needs to stand behind those that are giving everything, their very lives, to stand up for climate, against climate change. Uh, thank you for that, and and uh, and thank you for bringing in those the, those stories and and um, and memories of of um, activists on the ground. Uh, David, I'm wondering uh, what you've heard from Pema. How does that resonate with what we know with regard to the climate crisis and and human rights globally? Yeah, I mean, those are very powerful and moving stories, and they, they reflect not only the situation in Tibet, but the situation all around the world, in, not only in climate vulnerable nations where the impacts are being disproportionately felt in places like Tibet, the South Pacific, the Caribbean, the Sahel region of Africa, but across the world. And you know, one of the, one of the privileges of being the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment is I do get to travel to uh, countries around the world. And you know, the very first UN mission that I undertook was to Fiji. And I'll, I'll never forget visiting Vuni Dongaloa, which is one of the first communities in the world that had to be completely relocated. So this is a community that had been living for hundreds or thousands of years in kind of an idyllic location right beside the ocean dependent on the ocean for everything, from their culture to their economy. And because of the climate crisis, because of saltwater contamination of their drinking water, their agricultural lands, because of rising sea levels, they had to uproot their entire community and move inland three kilometers. And so now they're, they're, in, a, they're, in, a, they're in a forest, they're in a place where elders and children, pregnant women, persons with disabilities can no longer even get to the ocean. It's a very steep a uh, three kilometer trail in very hot and humid conditions. And so that's that's one example of how the climate crisis is infecting, is affecting uh, vulnerable populations in Fiji. My next mission was to Norway. And I spent uh, a, chunk of, a chunk of time north of the Arctic Circle uh, visiting the Sami indigenous people in Northern Norway. And I met with a, a group of young reindeer herders who, who expressed to me their, their fear that they would be unable to continue their tradition their traditional livelihood of uh, reindeer herding, because now in northern Norway during the winter, because of changing climate conditions, uh, it's not simply snow that the reindeer can scrape away with their hooves to get to the food that sustains them. They're getting warm temperatures, which melts the snow. They're getting rain, which together with freezing temperatures creates ice. And reindeer simply have not evolved to be able to access their traditional food supplies through the ice. And I, I could go on and on. I met with pastoralists in Kenya whose cattle have starved to death because of a multi-year drought exacerbated by climate change. And so I think that as you know, the majority of people here on this webinar are Canadians or Americans, we have to recognize that this is, this is a global emergency of our making. It is the people of the wealthy industrialized world that have largely created the climate crisis, and it must be our responsibility to solve this crisis. And that, that is really the, the, the lens which human rights can put on this problem. Uh, because it creates obligations and rights. And I really believe that as part of the right to a healthy environment, which on a brighter note was recognized for the first time by the United Nations last October, that everyone has the right to live 
in a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, a right which surely includes a safe climate, then if people around the world, particularly vulnerable and disadvantaged communities in places like Tibet, Fiji, and Kenya have that right, then somebody has the responsibility to take action to protect and fulfill that right. And, and that is us. It's China as the largest emitter. It's Canada and the United States as huge historical and huge ongoing per capita emitters. It's the wealthy countries and the wealthy people of the world who have an obligation. This is no longer an option. We can't talk about we could do this or we could do that. We must stop the burning of fossil fuels. We must stop deforestation. We must transform the industrial agriculture system into something sustainable to feed the planet's people. Um, and these are these are urgent, urgent actions that are needed. And I think that that can't be uh, stated often enough that this is an emergency and we're simply not dealing with it in those terms. Uh, and we will come back to that uh, Human Rights Council resolution and, and whether that offers some new openings, um, but thanks for flagging that. Um, Elizabeth, do you see similarities, differences in what you heard from Pema and, uh, and what we face in Canada? Oh, I mean, Pema's words were so incredibly powerful and I wanted to start by saying how you know, appalling and I mean, it, there, there really aren't words to express properly solidarity, sympathy, empathy, horror at how Tibetans have been treated uh, by the, the uh, occupying Chinese forces. It's a totalitarian state. It's clearly, um, it's clearly both part of the climate solution, part of the problem. And as David talked about China being the world's largest emitter, I just want to make a really strong point there that, that in terms of the volume of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, China hasn't caught up with the industrialized world, with what the US did, because the emissions that are in our atmosphere are now exerting a warming pressure on the climate system. Um, you know, carbon dioxide that comes out the tailpipe is active in the atmosphere warming for a hundred years. So it takes a while. On an annual basis, China has taken over from the US as the world's largest polluter on an annual basis. But as, as David suggested, the historic emissions, well, they're not history, they're historic. I wanted to get back to the, the question of, you know, what does it resonate? Yes, it resonates with abuse of, of indigenous rights in this country. The strongest actions to protect the climate that have been taken in Canada so far have been indigenous occupations to say, this is our land. We do not want your pipeline here. We do not want um, exploitation for fossil fuels here. Uh, those actions have actually been far more successful than anything our government has done to avoid greenhouse gas emissions. But to David's earlier point about the great campaigns and the conflicts that have had transformational change, I put you, you know, the, the, we, we don't actually recognize, we, we talk about slavery. We were, of course, currently there's more slaves than there ever were before, but the, the classic understanding of slavery uh, before uh, the, uh, the British Empire banned slavery, before the, uh, the Canada was, of course, with British Empire, and then the US. That was what slavery was, was the energy source before fossil fuels. That drove the economy. That drove the beginning of the of, of the dominance of the U.S. economy and and the British Empire was slavery. Now they managed to convince the people of the world that slavery should end. It wasn't easy in parliaments around the world, but it was a decision taken not because here we can show you an economic alternative for this transition. It'll be great. Look at your economy is going to be better off. No, it was a moral and an ethical turning point. Is a moral and an ethical question. And I think that's where we have to frame the climate crisis. The abuse in our generation right now, the inequity between the most marginalized are the people who most suffer from the climate impacts now and future generations that do not have a, current, a voice in, and not just future generations in some abstract sense, our own kids right now are gonna suffer if we don't make a massive decision that fossil fuels are over, that the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, which by the way is majority foreign owned, they're not Canadian producers, your day is done. You're going away. We are not going to continue to pander with putting public money into building pipelines. Well, obviously this is not something you hear from any government. They keep wanting to pretend that having your cake and eating it too is a moral choice. Uh, the choices before us, as David said, are very stark. We're in an emergency. If we want to protect 
the third pole. If we want to protect the Tibetan plateau, if we want to make sure that that and 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 the, the parallelism here of climate activists who are killed for raising concern for endangered species because they are Tibetan, that's the real brilliance. And thank God, as Canadians, uh, Canadian climate activists may get jailed now and then, but we don't get killed for raising our concerns. We get ignored. But we don't get killed, and it's we need to find our path through so that the voices for climate justice are the voices for human rights. And I want to pick up on those last two words, human rights, um, because obviously we've we've brought human rights very much into the frame uh, in this conversation, and increasingly so. Uh, David's special rapporteurship is uh, human rights and the environment. Uh, and we certainly hear more and more climate change in human rights, climate crisis in human rights, climate justice in human rights. I guess very quickly from each of you, why does that matter beyond it feeling good and sounding good? And you know, human rights is always you know, uh, kind of uplifting and inspiring language to bring into a debate. But does it make a concrete difference? Uh, Pema, how about you start? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Alex. I think. The answer for when it comes to, you know, everything that I know, the culture that I grew up in, the family that raised me, human rights is, uh, human rights for Tibetans is everything for climate change and for climate sustainability inside Tibet. Uh, in Tibet, even, you know, the prayer flags that so many people um, have seen that like they say, okay, they see those prayer flags and they see Himalayas. I was even at COP26 and, you know, at the presidency's um, pavilion, they even had, you know, a, a photo of prayer flags. Um, but no mention of Tibet. And I think that when it comes, when you like disconnect the people that, that prov provide that culture and that understanding of the earth and their practices, that to me is, is unjust. And it's a very, it's not decolonial, it's post-colonial mindset. Um, and I think that's just kind of the wrong path for us to be moving down. Uh, those prayer flags, they represent, each color represents a different symbol of you know, the world and the ecosystem. And that's kind of exactly how Tibetan culture has, um, and the prayer flags are influenced by Buddhism. They have scriptures on them, but the meaning of prayer flags actually precedes Buddhism in Tibet. It's actually one of, it's a tradition of the indigenous people of Tibet prior to Buddhism even existing in Tibet. And so that's how long Tibetan culture and um, people and way of life have centered climate and environment in their way of life. And that's similar with, I think, many different communities around the world. Um, and it really is, you know, colonizers and colonization that has changed that in many areas. So I think by not centering human rights, we're not breaking that link. We're not breaking, we are breaking that link between the people and the practices that we're you know, trying to emulate. And so even as a climate movement, we need to be relinking those. We need to be relinking the people and the practices of sustainability. And David, you're obviously very focused on this link uh, through your work as special rapporteur, and and you and you touched on 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 how important the human rights dimension of this is in your opening remarks. Wondering if you might be able to share a bit uh, from your experience to give us a feeling as to the concrete difference it can make. What what does human rights add uh, to the debate? Sure. Thanks, Alex. Well, I would say there's a number of things. The first thing is more uh, symbolic, which is that human rights puts a human face on a problem that for too many years has seemed abstract to the majority of people in the global north. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the human rights system, both at the international and national level, provides accountability. It provides institutions, mechanisms, and processes by which people can actually hold governments and, importantly, businesses accountable. And we're just beginning, we're, we're in the very exciting early stages of witnessing that transformation uh, around the world. And, and I can give you example after example, but just a handful to, to, to provide some inspiration. We had the, the decision of the Supreme Court of the Netherlands in 2019 in the what's called the Urgenda case, where the Supreme Court of the Netherlands, after reviewing the scientific evidence from the IPCC, determined that the Dutch government was not taking sufficiently ambitious action on climate change to protect the human rights of its citizens. And thus the court ordered the government to accelerate its reductions of greenhouse gas emissions on a very tight schedule. That's one example. More recently, there was a decision from the Constitutional Court of Germany, which found that the German government, which actually had fairly ambitious climate targets, 
was still not doing enough to address the human rights consequences of the climate crisis. Uh, the German Constitutional Court, which is very conservative, found that the, the liberty rights of, of young people in Germany were being violated by the government of Germany's inadequate climate action. And so the court ordered the government to um, amend its climate legislation and strengthen its climate targets, which the government of Germany then did. In Colombia, in South America, a, a group of 25 amazing children and youth brought a lawsuit against their government saying that deforestation in the Amazon portion uh, of Colombia was a violation of their constitutional right to live in a healthy environment. And the Supreme, Supreme Court of Colombia agreed with those kids and ordered the government to come up with and implement a plan to end deforestation. Back in the Netherlands again, more recently, there was a court decision holding Royal Dutch Shell accountable for the human rights implications of its greenhouse gas emissions and ordering this huge transnational corporation to reduce its emissions 45% by 2030, beginning to approach the kind of scale that, re, that is required. And so that's, that's the second really critically important thing about a human rights approach. And the third thing I think, which ties into what Pema was saying and what Elizabeth was talking about is all around the world, we have these human rights defenders working to protect the land, working to protect biodiversity, working on climate justice, and they're being killed. Hundreds of people being killed every year. These people are being uh, harassed, criminalized, uh, killed, and we really need to, to stop and, and assess this situation and recognize that these people are not criminals. They are actually heroes for people and the planet, and governments have a really important responsibility to protect these people and to honor them rather than to criminalize and marginalize them. So I think that's another thing that recognizing these are human rights issues and these are human rights defenders can be really powerful. Uh, well said. And, and Elizabeth, I know um, I've heard you many times over the years bring human rights into how you frame and, and discuss climate issues. Why has that been important to you? What do you think it adds? Well, reality, I mean, we, none of these issues can be spoken about without discussion of who has the power, who's being oppressed. Uh, the the uh, destruction of Mother Earth by rampant greed broken down to what it really is. Economist David Corton once described the current conflict around the world as not any longer capitalism versus communism or socialism versus, you know, it's not about the systems and the isms. He said, right now we're in the fight between life and money. And I hate to tell you right now, money is winning. Greed and exploitation, but the oppressed peoples have to be recognized and acknowledged as the front line victims of oppression. It's an old story. It hasn't really changed. So the elites of the world, the billionaire class, uh, Bernie Sanders line, but the billionaire class is calling the shots. I don't care if Elon Musk wants to go to Mars. I'd like to get him a one-way ticket. Right? This, there is such deep injustice in the world. that If you carry on as an environmentalist, as though it's we can all agree. I mean, it's what it's what uh, Greta Thunberg calls the happy clappy. It's all going to be great. We'll keep making money. No, <laughs> we have to actually fundamentally address oppression, occupiers and occupied. We have to have solidarity with the occupied or we can't make any sense of anything at all. So that's why I, I tend to try to integrate. I've, I've worked on indigenous rights within Canada much longer than I've worked on on human rights more generally, I suppose. But if you don't acknowledge, I mean, it was also, of course, a, a great Canadian who, who wrote the first draft of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. If we don't acknowledge our shared humanity as being one human family with, with major challenges to our survival, if we don't find our commonalities, we don't work our way through the nature of the threats. And of course, the billionaire class is very good Oh, it's fascists have always been good at this, at making the people who are most oppressed feel that, that, that their enemies are the others, uh, not, not the wealthy elites, uh, not the corporations, not totalitarian governments, but you know that other guy who just moved in to take my job. We have to be very, very careful to find ways to constantly reinforce the, the responsibility of allyship. And, and for the peoples of Tibet, again, for the Tibetans, and I was, you mentioned, Alex, that I was the executive director of Sierra Club Canada. I don't know in what year it was I joined the Canada 
Tibet committee, but I don't know, more than 20 years ago. And through that, I've had the extraordinary privilege and honor of, of meeting with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. The first conversation we ever had around a table in Ottawa with supporters of a free Tibet what included this conversation about what do we do to protect the Tibetan plateau. You can't protect the Tibetan plateau if you're not protecting Tibetans, even though the threat to the Tibetan plateau is truly global. And it's about all of us and how we continue to think that we need fossil fuels in our lives. So it's, I'm not giving you a clear answer because it is, it's so inter, it's, it's a complex web of relationships, which is the nature of ecosystems on the planet. And it's also the nature of humanity being in one human family. Uh, well, complex, but I think really what, what I'm hearing from all of you is uh, it's about human rights because how could it not be about human rights? And, um, and I like the fact we've got a new climate justice strategy from Elizabeth, one-way tickets to Mars. <laughs> um, uh, Pema, I want to pick up on something that David highlighted in his answer, and, and we heard very powerfully from you um, about this in, your, in one of your earlier responses as well, and it is about human rights defenders. Uh, and you've, you've obviously, you've shared some examples already of, of what it is to be a Tibetan environmental human rights defender. But I'm wondering if you wanted to say a little bit more um, about that um, in Tibet, but also outside of Tibet. What is it like uh, to do uh, work on these issues? Sure, thanks, Alex. Um, and I think inside Tibet is where all the human rights defenders that you know they have given, they give everything. Like when they wake up in the morning and they choose to defend human rights, um, they're choosing to sacrifice their existence, their life, their, their family, their safety uh, in a way that like myself as a Tibetan in exile, when I wake up in the morning and choose to be an activist, it's a very different decision. And I think that was, you know, something that, you know, for example, when I was in Glasgow, I remember there was um, a reporter who wanted to talk about the Tibet climate crisis. And he just came with me and he's been reporting. He's like a climate reporter. He's been, you know, interviewing climate activists all day. And he came and said, so Pema, why did you come here from Tibet? And to me, that just in that one moment showed me how little um, the climate movement at this point knows about Tibet. And so, you know, I explained to him, Tibetans from Tibet, if, if someone came to COP, they'd never see their family again, or they'd, or they'd be in jail and dead by the end of the year. By the, by the last, you know, by the end of the negotiations, they'd, they'd be, you know, in jail. And so to me, that, that kind of is what it is. So that's why climate activists, Tibetans like myself, my dad was born in a free Tibet, you know, my grandparents and ancestors were nomads, but my parents had to flee Tibet due to the violence and occupation of Tibet. And so me, when I have grow up, grow up in, in um, a democratic country and I have more rights to speak out, it's not my voice that I'm trying to share. It really is the voice of Tibetans inside Tibet who would be killed for sharing the same message. And I think that at the same time though, when we go to these conferences, for example, um, at COP26, we had a delegation of five Tibetan women who were there we represented um, different groups and, and but our main goal, you know, we sat down for our first meeting, we got to Glasgow and we looked at each other and we said, what do the people of Tibet, the nomads, um, the, 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 the children, the young people, what, what message do they need heard at this conference? And we made a list of things that we wanted to share and we made a game plan. But the reality is that Tibetans and Tibet human rights groups can't even get accreditation to conferences like COP on our own. We have to go and ask other groups, say, can you afford to give us one of your accreditations because of China's influence in these arenas? Mm. And so when we go to these areas also, for example, we have no space in the actual negotiations. Mm. Tibetan nomads, that's a practice of pastoralism that's been around for 10,000 years and protected billions of lives for all those years. And at the same time, um, there is no voice for Tibetans at the negotiations. And so, for example, for us, for me, as a young Tibetan, I know that, you know, um, my grandparents and ancestors protected Tibetan Plateau, and so many lives depend on the Tibetan Plateau. Even our way of life, our culture can hardly exist without that plateau, because uh, it's so deeply embedded in our, in our uh, heritage and in our Tibetan way of life. But at the same time, even you know, according to like, for example, the 2019 special report by the IPCC on oceans and the cryosphere, by the end of you know, possibly my lifetime, when I'm very old, if I I'm lucky enough to live a long life. Two thirds of Tibet's entire glaciers will be gone. 
and even if the 1.5 degree warming is, you know, kept alive, which Elizabeth has rightfully so like raised a lot of doubts about, one third of the Tibet's glaciers will still be gone. And I think there are many communities that are like this, where even if 1.5 is kept alive, the imp impacts on their community will be detrimental. And Tibetans are one of those, you know, one of the, the Mapa communities. But one of the big differences is, I'm sure there are some others like Tibetans as well, but one of the big differences is that Tibetans have zero voice, zero platform um, at, at spaces like the actual negotiations of treaties. So I think that's what it's like to be a Tibetan climate activist. You know, we saw and met many climate activists, young people that were so inspiring from different countries and they were there to pressure their, you know, delegations to do better. And we were there, who do we, who do we pressure? Who do we speak to? Um, who do we say do a better job on our climate policies? The Chinese government, the government that you know threatened my father as a 10 year old to have to flee over the Himalayas on foot with his, for his very own life. These are the people, you know, there is no place for us. Um, that's what, this is the, one of the biggest struggles of being a Tibetan climate activist. Like who do we ask to improve the policies? Um, and so I think that's why also it goes back to the question of human rights. That goes back to the question that says, why the human rights and the increased rights of Tibetans inside Tibet is so important. Because without those rights there, we are left defenseless against you know, the Chinese regime where we need, if the more rights we have as Tibetans and the more rights Tibetans inside Tibet have, um, the more power, the more um, you know, self-ownership Tibetans will have over their own land and making their own policies that will impact billions um, for many years and many generations to come. Such an important reminder, uh, really, in your words there that you know, one of the most essential reasons why we need to understand this as a human rights struggle is about voice, uh, as, you've, as you've highlighted so powerfully. Uh, David, let's turn to the Human Rights Council. And you, you gave us a little teaser uh, about this earlier, but uh, last fall, of course, there were two uh, groundbreaking decisions taken at the Human Rights Council. Uh, the first, for the first time, to recognize that there is a human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And the second, uh, again, for the first time, to establish uh, a colleague for you, uh, a new UN Special Rapporteur on climate change and human rights. And we should know who that person is in the coming weeks. Why do those decisions matter? Do you, does that give you some sense of hope? Uh, that there'll be some new openings? And, and I guess, given our focus today, does it give us any openings with respect to the Tibetan Plateau? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take the second question first, which is the appointment of a new special rapporteur on human rights and climate change. And I think this is terrific because it will enable the spotlight to be shone directly on these challenges that we've been discussing today. And um, that special rapporteur will report to the Human Rights Council, will report to the General Assembly, will undertake country visits, will produce reports, and and just continue to elevate our understanding of how closely intertwined the climate emergency and human rights actually are. Something I've been trying to do and something that my predecessor tried to do as well, but having someone specifically focused on that, I think is, is really indicative of what the president, or sorry, the high commissioner for human rights, Michelle Bachelet said, which is that the world has never seen a human rights crisis of the magnitude of the climate crisis. So, so that's an important step. And the resolution recognizing for the first time at the global level that everyone has the right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, that's just a historic turning point in the history of human rights. I mean, there was no right to a healthy environment in the Universal Declaration in 1948 because people weren't really aware of the impact humanity was having on this beautiful planet that we all love and share. But in the, in, in the ensuing decades, it has become crystal clear that there are complex and multiple interconnections between environmental degradation and human rights. And you know, the Stockholm Declaration 50 years ago this year hinted at the existence of a right to a healthy environment. And then countries began to put it into their constitutions. And we now have, you know, in some countries, more than four decades of experience. And that experience shows that the right recognition of the right to a healthy environment at the national level is a catalyst for stronger laws, stronger implementation of those laws, and most importantly, improved implementation and improved environmental performance in terms of reductions in air pollution, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. So my sincere hope is that the recognition of this right by the United Nations will be a catalyst for change, will be a catalyst for changes to constitutions, changes to laws, but most importantly, changes in practices on the ground that protect people's human rights. And we have a precedent to draw upon, which is in 2010, 
the United Nations recognized for the first time the rights to water and sanitation. And that these UN resolutions are not legally binding or enforceable. So you can't go to court or go to your government and say, hey, you've, you've violated this UN resolution. But they are catalysts for change. And so what's happened in the 12 years since, those, uh, since that resolution in 2010 on the right to water is that a number of countries have incorporated the rights to water and sanitation into their constitutions. Costa Rica, Fiji, Mexico, Slovenia, Tunisia. Other countries have incorporated that right into their environmental laws like France and Colombia. And most importantly, countries have made changes on the ground to deliver that basic fundamental human right of clean water in adequate quantities to people around the world. In Mexico, uh, not only did they change their constitution, but they created a program to bring safe drinking water to rural communities. And they've delivered safe drinking water in the past decade to more than 1,000 rural communities in Mexico that did without. In Slovenia, they've undertaken to provide safe drinking water to Roma communities living, living on the outskirts of Ljubljana and other Slovenian cities. And here in Canada, you know, it's really interesting. Canada abstained when that vote, on, when that historic vote came before the United Nations General Assembly. We didn't have the courage to vote yes. We had previously opposed recognition of the right to water. But a couple of years after that resolution passed, we, our government did recognize, okay, well, if the United Nations says this is a human right, we have to go along with that. And that was one of the steps that led the Trudeau government to start its uh, concerted effort to end the long-term drinking water advisories in Canada's Indigenous communities. In 2015, there were over 150 Indigenous communities suffering from long-term lack of access to safe drinking water in this beautiful, wealthy country of ours. That number is down to approximately 40 today. So there's been tremendous progress. There's obviously still work to do, but you can trace this back to that UN resolution recognizing the rights to water. Canada also just settled a class action lawsuit with First Nations promising to or committing $8 billion to continuing this process of delivering on the fundamental government obligation of providing safe drinking water. So that's a, that's a series of reasons for optimism about the potential impact of this UN resolution on the right to a healthy environment. And I can tell you that that's, that's, there's probably going to be a similar resolution at the General Assembly in a couple months' time. I really hope that this time Canada will be on the right side of history and will vote for that resolution. And then the challenge is implementation. And we have to have all hands on deck to implement this fundamental human right. And that goes back to a really important issue of democracy. People have to have access to environmental information. They have to have the right to participate in environmental decision making. And they have to have access to justice when their right is being threatened or violated. So those are part and parcel of the right to a healthy environment. And I think that those procedural or participatory rights really need healthy democracy so that they can flourish. Uh, and a good action point in that with that reminder about the General Assembly, uh, because, of course, Canada is not a member of the UN Human Rights Council. So the question of us voting yes, no or abstaining didn't come up there, but it will uh, come up at the General Assembly. So note to all of us to stay vigilant uh, to that. Uh, Elizabeth, um, uh, so Pema's had us uh, in, in Tibet. Uh, David's taken us to the world stage. I want to bring us back to Canada for a moment. Uh, and um, but with 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 a reminder that we are focused on Tibet. Uh, why is that a Canadian concern? Why, uh, should we um, why should we see this not simply as you know something that should concern us? Because what Pema has reminded us us of is that there's very serious and grave consequences playing out on the ground in Tibet. Uh, but why does this implicate us as Canadians? I think it, I know it's hard to to find the justification for why it does, but I know it does. I think part of it is in the message of peace and unbelievable patience and compassion that His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, personifies. The message, when, when, whenever His Holiness comes to Canada, um, there isn't a rock band that needs a bigger stadium than His Holiness the Dalai Lama. People are desperate, like the, the, the materialistic, secular, um, consumer society that we live in that doesn't see us as citizens but sees us as consumers. We're in a deep spiritual crisis uh, in in our in our culture, 
And the message of, it, of, of the His Holiness the Dalai Lama transcends politics. It actually raises people up. And the, the feeling I think of Canadians, and it's hard to generalize around Canadians. I don't know what it is to be Canadian when we have people who think it's appropriate to, to, to show up and take over Ottawa and torment the local citizens. And they have a lot of supporters, even among my friends, who think, oh, it's almost like Occupy Wall Street. These, these, these people are representing the grassroots, taking on the powerful. There's some very tricky things going on right now. I notice in the le on the left, a real unwillingness to criticize the People's Republic of China as if that falls into US hegemony and, and we should you know, give China a break on all these issues and not be so forceful about protecting the rights of the people in Hong Kong. There's some very interesting um, fault lines opening up in discussions around human rights and particularly around the People's Republic of China. But I think overwhelmingly Canadians want to see Tibetan human rights respected. And it may be that I'm wrong about it having any kind of spiritual link to the message of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It may just be the sense that of, of justice, that this is wrong, that we can see that this is wrong, that we'd like, we, if we could do anything as a country, it would be to stand up here. I would, I want to just jump on one little point with um, David's point about how we UN resolutions aren't enforceable. I, I, I skipped over it, but I do want to emphasize the difference between the Montreal Protocol that actually worked and saved the ozone layer in 1987, the Montreal Protocol, which was negotiated in the same kind of process as our climate agreements, but it worked. And also the, the difference was that in 1987, the World Trade Organization didn't exist yet. And we could use trade sanctions in the Montreal Protocol to protect the ozone layer. We were denied access to trade sanctions in negotiating the climate treaties. I raise this because I think if we actually could use trade sanctions to enforce human rights law, trade sanctions to in, in, enact protections of the right to, to, to water, we have essentially a global government. It's as, you know, if you were to, there was a, a sort of, it was a long time ago, sort of a political cartoon of, of, of four panes of a window and you could see like department of this department. So department of justice was an empty desk. Department of the environment was an empty desk. But Department of Trade, well, that's really got functioning tools in it. So global governance is real, but it lets down the environment. It abandons human rights. It only protects, for instance, a, a pirated Michael Jackson CD in your trunk in any country around the world. If you try to take it across a border, the, the domestic laws have been you know, uh, homogenized such that intellectual property rights, particularly for the U.S. model, are protected. Uh, if you if if you're smuggling, if you have if you have carpets made by small children, you can't interfere with that because that's called a process and production method in international trade law, and you can't be discriminating against a product because it was made with slave labor. Oh no, but you can't. Absolutely, you must. You're required to intervene if you're offending the intellectual property rights of, for instance, the pharmaceutical industry. We still don't have Canada on the right side of getting a waiver under the trade-related intellectual property rights such that vaccines are available to developing countries without the patent protections for big pharma. What kind of craziness is this? So we have tools that we should be able to use in a multilateral context. We're denied their use because we don't line up on the right side of the, well, the wealthy and the powerful. Uh, the tools of the wealthy and the powerful preserve and protect their rights, but have never been put at the, uh, uh, as available, even available to protecting the rights of the people of Tibet. Alex, Not may the I just first jump time in? Double standards have come up when we're talking about human rights concerns. Uh, David. Yeah, I just want to jump in, in in terms of responding to your question about Canada's role in the climate crisis and the implications for Tibet, because I think it's really important to say we have two things that we've actually must do. One is we must reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. We have made promise after promise, set target after target. We have missed every target we have ever set, and we are not on path to meet the targets we have set for 2030. So that is job number one for Canada, is to reduce our emissions, which are contributing to human rights violations around the world. And then number two comes when we talk about, you know, we've talked about money, but 
Canada as a wealthy nation has to step up to the plate. We have to contribute to fulfilling the commitment of wealthy nations to mobilize $100 billion a year in climate finance, which is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's needed. And thirdly, uh, there's this conversation that's been taking place very painfully uh, during the climate negotiations over the past 30 years about something called loss and damages. You know, we have mitigation to reduce uh, to try and reduce the impacts of climate change. We have adaptation to prepare for the inevitable, but we also have to compensate climate vulnerable nations for the unavoidable. Uh, these are the impacts that they are already experiencing. And Canada continues to oppose financing for loss and damages. I just got back from a, a country mission to the Caribbean where these countries are being pounded by multiple category five hurricanes. They're, they've barely rebuilt from the last one when the next one hits. They're not responsible for the climate crisis, but they're forced to put all of their resources into rebuilding infrastructure and rebuilding people's homes when they need to be putting money into education and healthcare and, and developing their society. Canada cannot continue to oppose financing for loss and damage. I mean, this is a moral issue and we are on the wrong side of it. Well said. Um, I have a couple more questions I'm going to keep in my back pocket because I know we want to make sure that that people can um, uh, can ask questions directly. Um, I see a couple have come up in the chat box, which I'll come to. And while I'm doing so, uh, anyone out there uh, in our audience, if you do have a question, there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you can pop it in there and I will try to get to it. So uh, Elizabeth, the first question is for you. Uh, and it is, um, can green capitalism slash socialism save life? Um, and examples are given of the UN's net zero banking alliance, recognizing that net zero is not zero, <laughs> which is where we need to get to. And that 50% of Canadian Bay Street Bank's portfolio is in fossil fuels. I don't know how to what green capitalism would mean, but I, I, listen, I, I want to just underscore what David said. Not only have we not hit any target we've ever set, we have never gotten the direction right, right? When you say we miss our target, somehow you picture a bullseye and someone's shot the arrow and they got somewhere out the outer edge. We're shooting in the other direction, right? We've never gotten the direction right. And our current target, if we hit it, is an admission of failure and that we didn't really ever mean what we said in Paris because our current target will not hold to 1.5 or do our part of the global effort to hold to 1.5. And when you think about this in the context of um, the banking system or where our money is, we structured, and this is back in the Cartier era. I mean, it was back in Lester B. Pearson and Tommy Douglas and kind of what I think of as kind of like, that's, that's the Camelot of Canada's parliament, right? We, we haven't gotten there in a long time, but that's when we laid down our social safety net and the you know, Canada pension plan to put your money safe as houses, right? In the Chrétien era, they decided our money should make money and the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board was created and its mandate is to make sure it gets a good return on investment. So our pension plan money held by our government is invested in fossil fuels. It's re they, they have a mandate as an investment board. They almost put money into private prisons in the US because that looked like a good way to re make a return on investment. So many of our teachers' pension plans, so much of the banking system is in fossil fuels. And when Mark Carney was asked by Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, to be a special envoy on climate finance, he asked Mark Carney, can you find $100 trillion to go into green and renewable energy. Mark Carney, I was also at COP26, so when Mark Carney came in with the news that he had $130 trillion. But that's banks saying, we have this money to invest in renewables. They didn't say they would divest from the money they also have invested in fossil fuels. So this, and net zero by 2050, by the way, is fraud. I can't say it strongly enough. Our government has put every bit of rhetoric, including the prime minister's speech in Glasgow, never mentioned 1.5 degrees, sticks to the idea that net zero by 2050 is a reasonable target. Net zero by 2050 is dangerous unless by 2030, it's going to where it needs to go, which is, I mean, the curve basically looks like this 
between now and 2030. Uh, Trudeau's version of that is it kind of goes blubbity up and then it comes down fast at the end. That means we've blown everything. That means we, the Tibetan plateau is 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 thawing out even faster. So I, I would say that what saves us is actually acting like we're in an emergency. All hands on deck as an approach and not allowing fake promises to, be, to exist. Unfortunately, our media doesn't is basically climate illiterate. And a lot of environmental groups, I hate to say it, are so afraid of the conservatives getting in again that they want they, they inadvertently give the liberals a free pass. We have to hold everyone to the same standard. Where are you on the science? Are you going through your actions to make the difference that holds to 1.5 degrees? I don't think we're going to be saved by any particular economic system. We have to be saved by acting like we know our lives depend on getting this right. And right now we're on the wrong side. As much as the rhetoric is great, we are not acting in the interests of our own children, much less their children. Uh, the next question is for you, Pema. Uh, is there, uh, or I guess, do you see a direct connection between China's gross human rights violations in Tibet and cultural genocide? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. I think. Um, so, I mean, Dichin Palmola wasn't able to join today and, um, you know, so she works with the Tibet Policy Institute at the Central Tibetan Administration, also known as the Tibetan government in exile. And one of the things that, you know, Dichin Palmola does a really great job at talking about, um, which I wanted to make sure to share here today, since she wasn't able to be here, is um, about some of the policies, such as like the forced migration of Tibetan people inside Tibet. And also like the forced policies. So there's two in particular that I would like to raise that I think show a really distinct tie between um, these climate issues that we're talking about and cultural genocide. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, since 1980, over 2 million Tibetans nomads have been resettled forcibly. And many of these resettlements are like thousands of the people that have been resettled are directly associated with um, these national park systems. And so, this is also a reason why from those in Canada and the US can really relate with this kind of um, policy. I think inside Tibet right now, there are the Chinese government is implementing these policies that they claim are for the purposes of environmental protection. And they have uh, what they call ecological migrants. And that's what they call nomads. They call them, they say that these nomads are harming the environment and that they are actually creating a national reserve where the environment will remain untouched. And that will, the gap will include the resettlement of nomads. Um, and so this policy directly, I th in my, um, this policy directly, I think genocides culturally the nomads because their way of life, their identity and their heritage is directly tied with their, their practices, their nomadic and pastoral practices. And then this also is um, something, a policy that's directly linked to this, um, not on paper, but, um, I think it thematically is residential schools. So when you say that, it might not make sense directly to somebody who doesn't understand the issues, but if you look deeper, actually, how are the Chinese government able to uh, force these nomads off their lands non-violently, like in a way that, uh, you know, as cheap as possible. And one of the ways is like, because these nomads love their children and these nomads, you know, like for example, the residential schooling programs, there's been like, um, you know, accounts that say that some of these children are coercively taken into residential schools and that forces families to stay nearby if they actually care to see their children at all. Whereas nomads used to travel, you know, thousands of miles around um, the plateau, grazing and living the lifestyle in, pastor in a pastoral, pastoral way. Now, so many nomad families are like tied to one area because they need to see their children. Their children have been coercively ripped apart and taken into residential boarding school programs. And so these two policies actually go hand in hand. And there are two policies that Canada should be like, you know, extremely familiar with as, as the US as well. And I think that this also goes to say because Canada in recent years has made, you know, in recent months, I should even say, made, made many statements about how terrible the residential schooling programs were, everything from citizens to, you know, like um, to local authority figures, government politicians, or like celebrities have all been commenting on these residential boarding school programs. But are they really, really, do they really, really feel that that was the mistake? Or are they just ashamed that now they're being, you know, exposed for this mistake? And I think if they truly believe that that was a mistake in Canada's past, then they should also look into residential boarding school programs that still exist today 
there's actually right now um, over 1 million Tibetan children that are being held in CCP run residential boarding school programs, colonial boarding school programs, and over 800,000 Uyghur children that are also held at similar programs. So for example, in the Uyghur region, when parents were sent to uh, re-education camps, their kids were then sent to residential boarding school programs. In the Tibet region, when parents are nomads and they need to get them out of the, um, the land and they need to set up national forest reserves, they put the children also in residential boarding school programs and colonial boarding schools. And these children are as young as three or four years old. And there's actually uh, you know, a report that already came out from the um, Tibet Action Institute, which outlines, um, like for example, there was one leaked Chinese government policy, which was five plus two equals zero which means that if a Tibetan child spends five days at a residential colonial boarding school and they spend two days with their family, they lose all of the brainwashing and sinicization of that school. And they revert back to their ways of like their past, like their, their culture, essentially. And so that policy is to actually like tighten the, gra the, gra grisps, the grasps of the schools on the children, telling the local school administrators, if you let your child go home for two days, basically your work is zero progress. And that's the type of pressure they're, they're putting on the families. And that's from a leaked Chinese government document, the five plus two equals zero uh, policy. And so right now, um, over 80% of Tibet's children are in residential boarding school programs, colonial boarding schools. And what is that? What is the goal of those colonial boarding schools? It's to keep nomads in certain regions and to stop them from living their pastoral way of life that they've lived for 10,000 years. And also it's to, within a single generation, eradicate the culture and the language. And, you know, so for example, some people say, well, isn't it good for China, Tibetan students to learn Chinese so that they can develop their, you know, their, their, their progress in the economy. But for example, like myself, my name is Bema. And in Tibetan, that means like lotus. And it's supposed to symbolize when the world is really muddy, some positive can still come out. And I studied Chinese for six years and seven years. And in Chinese, my name is Pema. And it's two empty radicals that mean nothing. And so, my explanation for that, the reason why I share that with you guys is because although economic progress is, is sure, I guess in many, many um, reasons, people think it's very positive for Tibetan nomad children being taken to a residential boarding school program, having their everything from their name, sinicized, the morning they wake up, the first thing they see is a CCP appointed a staff member to basically raise these children. Within a single generation, we may see, um, you know, children that have lost all ties to their culture to the deep rich meaning of their own names. Um, and this is like something that those in Canada should deeply understand as well, understand that they should be leaders because of their past history on these issues and say actually the genocide, the cultural genocide of Tibetan children and nomads needs to end. And also aside, um, aside like extraneous outcome of that will be more sustainable environment in that region. Empowering Tibetan nomads and Tibetan children helps the environment, but it also protects their human basic human rights. Oh, a particularly grim and harrowing reminder of, uh, of a resonance between uh, these issues across Canada and Tibet. Um, uh, I, I think I've got time for two questions left here, one of which has been posed directly to you, uh, David, and the other one I think is more general, uh, so we'll see if we've got time for everyone to take a kick at it. Um, uh, David, your question is, um, understanding that Tibet is closed off uh, to international independent agencies, despite claims by the Chinese authorities that Tibetans enjoy immense development, has your office requested access to Tibet uh, to study the developments and its impact of climate on climate change? What has their response been? Uh, considering they ignore such requests, given the climate emergency, um, does your office have any plans uh, to, to request a visit to China? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, the, basically, the rules around special rapporteurs is that we're able to do two country visits every year, and we require the permission of the host government in order to do so. So uh, two years ago, I requested permission from China to do a country visit and uh, did not receive a positive response. And I will be renewing that request this year uh, because I would really dearly love to visit China, including, uh, including the Tibet region. I think you know, what happens in China is so critical to the future of humanity and sustainability on this planet. It's probably the single most imp important country that I could visit for many of the reasons we've been talking about today. So I, I do remain hopeful, although not optimistic that I'll be able to visit China in my UN role. 
Yes, uh, human rights access to China I, is always an uphill battle. Can I jump in on something? I mean, uh, uh, in speaking of human rights, it's one thing to know that the People's Republic of China is a totalitarian regime, but Israel is our ally and supposedly a democracy. And the treatment of the Palestinian people in the occupied territories is egregious. But the special UN Rapporteur on Human Rights and Palestinian Peoples is also a Canadian academic, has never been allowed to travel to Israel. So I just mentioned that in passing because access to countries to seek out on the ground what's going on really does matter. And Israel is our ally. And I support the right of the state of Israel to exist. Obviously, I'm treading into another area. But if it, we're looking at human rights around the world, we have to step up. And then there's a number of, of countries which uh, are either selective or completely restrictive in allowing international access. And that's, that's a huge problem to the international system. The last question, uh, and I think I'm gonna have to sort of give you each maybe about 30 seconds on this, but it's a big one. Um, uh, uh, given that the PRC government is far from being open in terms of rights and holding the state and other actors accountable, are there other ways uh, that Tibetans, other indigenous nations who are earth protectors can begin to access their rights? What external fora exist to undergrid accountability? So I guess it's picking up on this, this closed, repressive, unresponsive nature of the Chinese government. Are there other strategies and avenues we could be pursuing? Um, Pema, why don't I start with you? Sure. <laughs> Uh, I think firstly, the international community absolutely needs to accept that there is a restriction on Tibetans inside Tibet, that they're not able to openly and freely advocate for their own environmental protection. And that means that if someone does have the bravery and courage to step up, the entire international community, including the special repertoires and politicians from you know, ally countries need to be ready to stand up on, on their behalf immediately but also they need to support and create more channels for activists that are standing in solidarity and amplifying um, those that are the children or those that are raised in, in exile as refugees or as the children of refugees. They need to be providing actual access and resources for them to be able to advocate and amplify the voices of Tibetans inside Tibet on these issues. Otherwise, if you just wait for Tibetans from inside just to, to, to be the ones that say that, say those voices, I think it's it's, it's, it's extremely unfair and you're basically asking somebody to give their life to speak um, on this issue. And David, you'll keep requesting access, uh, but are there other ways that we can pursue some strategies with respect to the Chinese government? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very difficult when you have a closed government like that. But one thing that I think we could potentially do is, you know, China still does go through the universal periodic review process at the Human Rights Council, and that is an opportunity for civil society and special rapporteurs and all of us to participate in, a, in an open, transparent process to review the human rights record of each individual country on a rolling five-year basis, which includes not only China, but Canada as well. And it does create uh, international pressure on those countries to do a better job of respecting, protecting, and fulfilling human rights. Great. Thanks. Good suggestion. And how about you, Elizabeth? It's such a tough question because it, when you're looking at, at the global climate negotiations, I've seen in many occasions China get blamed for the failure of a negotiation to succeed, such as in Copenhagen, when what I observed was that, that the People's Republic of China was not responsible for things falling apart. Much more so in that case was the government of Denmark that hosted and uh, the United States under Barack Obama. Um, in the most recent climate negotiations uh, in Glasgow, world media wanted to say, well, China wasn't here while well, Jing Jinping wasn't there, but the Chinese ne uh, negotiators, and I think it's a signal of real concern in taking the matter seriously, that the negotiator on behalf of the People's Republic of China was the very same person who negotiated in Paris and negotiated and has personal relationships I mean, in all these things. It's the right person at the right time that makes a big difference. The head of the negotiation has a good relationship with John Kerry. Is there any way to build on that? I mean, I'm looking for bright spots here. The, 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 people, the US and, and People's Republic of China was able to make a statement, not nailed down, that they were committed to making this work and holding to 1.5. That was a bit, it was too late. It didn't, we didn't have the impetus. We're not closing the doors on climate negotiations, although COP26 is a, was a dismal, but it wasn't completely a failure. And the thing that made it not a failure was the governments around the world didn't congratulate themselves on a great job. They all ended the session 
with wringing of hands and saying, we can't stop now. We have not done what we came here to do. This is disappointing. I've never been to a negotiation where governments stopped the hypocrisy before the final gavel. Can we build on something in, in shared? We, if there's anything humanity has in common, if, if, if a virus didn't make us realize we're all one human family, if, 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 a, if the, the, the metaphor from don't look up, I mean, we have the equivalent of a large meteor heading towards us with accelerating speed. Uh, we actually have more in common than in the difference now as humanity. Um, and this is not to say that um, we, you know we 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 can use economic sanctions. What got South Africa to stop apartheid? Looking at those lessons, we should be prepared to do what it takes to stand up and say to the People's Republic of China in every conversation, "We are upset about what you're doing in Tibet. What do we work with you? How do we solve this?" So, it, it, diplomacy, trade sanctions, individual actions all of the above. But the founding, the, the, the fundamental to me has to be, where do we find and build on the common ground of our shared humanity, on human rights, on a, a habitable biosphere, survival, these things rather matter. And, and, and governments around the world and peoples around the world um, are each other's allies. But the geopolitical mess that we're in uh, leaves it looking as if there's dividing lines. We have to, as I don't know, humanity organized. Don't know what that looks like exactly. It's I know in the last 10 seconds, I can't do it justice, but I do think there's more in common than in the difference. And we have to build on that. Pema Doma, uh, David Boyd, Elizabeth May, I can't thank you enough. This has been an incredibly engaging, informative, thoughtful exchange. Lots of really vital information and analysis shared. And I think we've had a, an action agenda start to emerge. We've certainly been reminded uh, about the importance of paying attention to what's going on at the United Nations. We've been reminded that you know, addressing what's happening in Tibet means keeping up that pressure for more meaningful Canadian climate action. And Pema's very poignantly um, reminded us of how important it is to stand with the Tibetan people, to be opening up and defending safe space for Tibetan human rights defenders, um, and, uh, and so much more. Thank you absolutely for all of that. And now I see his face has appeared on the screen. It's my pleasure to turn things over just for a few closing words to my dear friend and colleague, Sharat Thurchin, who is the Executive Director of the Canada-Tibet Committee. Uh Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm Sherab Tarchin, Executive Director of Canada Tibet Committee. Uh, I would like to thank you all on the behalf of Canada Tibet Committee. It's, it's truly an honor for us to collaborate with the University of Ottawa's uh, Human Rights Research and Education Center to organize this uh, urgent and important webinar. I'm grateful to Professor Alex Sneef, uh, Carolyn Fulcher for your support in making this webinar possible. Uh, I would also like to thank everyone in the audience today and acknowledge uh, the participation of our chairs, Sampil Halumba from CTC, uh, Peter Sharp and officials from the Global Affairs Canada, Puntok Wangmo and uh, from the office of MP Arif Hirani as the coordinator of parliamentary friends of Tibet and my colleagues uh, from the Canadian Coalition on China. Uh, the significance of the Tibetan plateau uh, as our speaker said today, is larger than Tibet itself, uh, but has always struggled to bring international attention to it. And with the participation of uh, UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Environment, David Boyd, uh, leading Canadian activists and parliamentarians on climate change, MP Elizabeth May, and Tibetan youth leader and climate activist, Pema Doma, I think this is a great step towards bringing that attention back to the Tibet, the third pole of the world. And with the PRC making claims on being a huge climate actor, I hope our partners and friends in the academics, in the government, parliament, and civil society will send a message to the PRC and let them know that the world is watching their policies and practices in Tibet. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I can't believe but we have actually ended exactly on time. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And let's take this all forward. There's obviously a lot of work still to do. <laughs>